not safe at all. And I'll probably get into trouble for saying this, but there's, there's a whole lot of cars like that where I would go, I, I cannot viably recommend this car to you. What's happening, guys? Welcome to a new episode of Jester Radio. Today, today's guest, Sam, from the car scene. You've probably seen him on Instagram, TikTok. If you're interested in cars, if you've ever been searching cars, if you've ever... You know, I'm pretty sure this audience and the people watching this love cars. As South Africans, I think we have a great appreciation for cars, maybe more because we can't afford them. <laughs> so so we watch <laughs> videos of nice cars and we watch videos of people reviewing cars and talking about, you know, the latest cars coming into the scene. So, Sam, thank you so much for coming on, bro. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jess. Of course, bro. And I mean... You actually, you know, you want to start your own podcast and I think that is a great idea for you and I think you should because, you know, you've got how many followers now on Instagram? Now it's sitting at around 62,000 and, and it's grown quite rapidly. TikTok? TikTok is at 24,000, I think. Okay. I don't really focus too much on TikTok. Instagram audience is a little bit more engaging for yeah, me yeah. at the moment. I think it's also maybe because TikTok is mainly younger viewers mm -hmm. and Instagram is probably, you know, the older viewers. I think those are the people that are actually looking at cars or yeah, totally. obviously have cars. Mm, majority of my audience is around 25 to 40 years old. Okay. Because you do do nicer top-end cars, you do mm. obviously do, you know, smaller entry-level cars, maybe first-time car, first time buyers type of cars. Mm. So what got you into the whole car scene? Sure. So it's um, it's quite a long story. So four years ago, might have actually been five years ago now. Time is just flying by so fast. Um, I wanted a platform where I could just post nice pictures about cars and just talk about them and just tell people like, hey, this is this car and this is what it has. It was never for the, for the, um, for the dream of this happening. I kind of just stumbled into this. Um, within a year, I ended up getting 8,000 followers. And all of a sudden, I had a launch invite from Porsche, my first ever car launch was in Cape Town. I mean, I was so oblivious that I messaged the PR back and said, uh, I don't have money for flights because at the time I was just 19 years old. So there I am, first launch is with Porsche and it put me onto a whole lot of other brands and all of a sudden I had more accessibility to cars and I realized, hey, you know what? This could actually turn into something pretty cool and I'm enjoying flying down to Cape Town. They put us up in five-star hotels. It's really quite a lavish lifestyle. Um, but I'm there for the cars. I'm not there for the trappings. It's just a nice little, it's a nice little perk. Yeah. So yeah, the more cars I posted, spoke about them more, the more people followed. And what was your first video? What car at least was in the first video? The first video, it would have been, ah, oh, so this is actually quite a funny story. Um, I had this mate, his name's Ulrich. I actually think he listens to the podcast. And we both wanted to do cars because we both have quite a big passion for it. So we approached the dealership, um, a Renault dealership, and they gave us a Renault Sondero. And the two of us reviewed this car, 18 year olds. It was like the most silliest review ever. Like he was in the boot at one stage, opened the boot, he's like, yo, the boot is really big. Um, so yeah, just, that was the first one. And then it just slowly progressed from there. Got better equipment, better cameras, and yeah, obviously we learned a lot more about the cars, but nowadays it's it's only me on the videos. This episode is sponsored by Nutricon. You can use the code MOVEMBER and save 20% off here in Joburg, this rainy weather. But this episode is also sponsored by St. Anger, a clothing company created and founded by someone that's actually been in the studio and rented out the facility. So I, I implore you to go and check out these, you know, vests, T-shirts, everything they have to offer. You can check out the link in the description. You can use the code ICONIC20 and save 20% off on all orders. Support the boy, support local, and back to the podcast. And I think that's the biggest thing maybe the audience, people watching this should understand is, you know, the best investment you can have is in yourself. And that's mm. exactly what you did by buying, you know, better quality cameras, better quality mics to improve the audio, mm. improve you know, what the viewer is going to see at the end of the day. And, you know, you've seen benefits from, you know, spending a bit of your hard-earned money, but, you know, seeing it as an investment. Totally. I agree with you. Um, a lot of the biggest jumps that I saw within progress was when I took money I earned from the business, the car scene, and reinvested it straight back into it. And at first, I mean, I was like 19 years old, 20 years old when I first started making money, and I signed a few contracts with some um, automotive dealerships. 
And then I realized, okay, well, I need better equipment. And as soon as I started getting better equipment, my work started becoming more professional and I ended up getting a lot more clients. So I totally agree. Best investment you can make is yeah. on yourself. And is it, you know, you can invest in stocks. You can lose money that way. Mm. You can invest in people. They can burn you. You can lose out in that way. You can invest in, you know, many different, you can invest in crypto. You can lose money so there. But things. if you invest in yourself, be it reading, be it training, be it diet, be it, you know, investing into studying there's always going to be a return in that there's totally. never going to be anything that you put into yourself in terms of you know progress that's mm. going to have a detrimental aspect to it yeah i agree with you i agree it's completely and i think the big thing is the age that we're at now like in our early 20s late 20s it's going to be the the time when we run into a bit of money and everybody's going like what should i invest in a lot of my friends are saying i want to invest in property and i'm saying Okay, cool. Though. Investing in property is a good idea, but it's such a long game. So then where else do you look? Like crypto stocks, it's all volatile industries. You might end up losing your money. So I always say, if there's something that you can do within yourself, if you have a skill and you feel you can get better equipment to make your skill more enhanced and therefore acquire more business and get more money, then it's totally worth it. There was a time I bought a camera gimbal. It cost me 12,000 rand. The very next day, I shot a video for a client that paid me 18,000 rand. That piece of equipment, Paid me back straight away. Yeah. And then every single video, professional video I filmed after that was just money on top. And it's also sometimes not about the actual creative value it gives you. It might just be the confidence boost it gives you. It might be, you know, okay, well, I've got this equipment. I've got professional grade equipment. Let me reach out to this dealership. Let mm. me do this because you have that backing in, you know, the equipment that you have and the skills that you can offer. And just by having that value, it gives you more confidence. Completely. So now you obviously... You know, you've got other businesses, but let's talk about the car scene and, you know, the financial kickbacks and, you know, how does that work in terms of, is it, okay, cool, we've got a launch for a certain vehicle, come out, we'll pay for your flights, accommodation. Is there obviously, you know, some annuity in that as well that they give you some cash? Uh, you see, you know, that's where the tricky thing comes. So a lot of the publications that get invited to launches, you get invited, you don't get paid. But a lot of the publications are magazines. So take Top Gear, Carmag, all of those guys, for example. All of those publications run ads. And for them to run ads, they need content. So when manufacturers give out cars, like now I'm driving this Mercedes GLB, the manufacturer gives me the car, I write about it. And it's the same thing with going on a launch. And the assumption from the manufacturer is that you have a whole business behind it where you employ journalists, you employ editors, etc., And that business makes money through ads. So... The car stuff that I do has always been a hobby, but now it's getting to the point where the platform is growing and I'm starting to get quite a lot of business out of it. So I work with quite a lot of car dealerships. We give them a helping hand um, just to boost their credentials a bit and do a couple of videos for them. And then a lot of the time we end up giving them a full suite digital marketing service with websites, um, Google ads, all of that content creation. And that's where majority of the money comes from. But now on the influencer part, because the page is gaining so much traction, starting to get a lot more contracts to do influencer partnerships with companies. So now there's one coming up with Honda South Africa. Um, and that's a paid media campaign. That's a peer, like to be appearing as a celebrity influencer on their commercials, mm. which is pretty cool. So it's getting to the point now where it's starting to, to pay money. I, at a time, was semi-partnered with Ford. So, you know, they would give me a vehicle for a week. I would drive it if mm. I was going away. And I mean, that was an amazing time and it was really fun because I wasn't obviously a, a journalist in terms of, you know, a vehicle car journalist the way you do it in terms of reviews. Mm. I would just go and if I was going to Kruger, they'd give me a Raptor. I'd go drive it there, take a little bit of videos mm. and then put it on my YouTube video, the vlog or whatever that I was making. And one of the launches that I went on was we went to George for, I think it was the new, well, it was the whole Ford range of Bucky's. It was the wild track, the XLT, oh, okay. and all of that. When I think that was about 2019, round about there. And you know, that was an amazing experience. And I'm sure, obviously, you've done some amazing trips where these brands have taken you out your to certain places. You know, what's one of your favorites that you've done? Flip. So there's there's been some incredible ones. Um, I recently got invited on my first international launch. So that was like an all-expenses-paid trip to Stockholm in Sweden by Nissan. And we went there literally to drive the new Qashqai e-power and an electric Nissan Aria. The whole event was centered around um, sustainability and 
greener, greener living. So we stayed at a whole eco-friendly Japanese hotel. It was just crazy. They took us on electric boats. We went sightseeing. I mean, I got taken to Europe by a car manufacturer. That's Amazing. like, like what? I'm 23 and this, this type of stuff is happening. But it's, it's crazy experiences all the time, to tell you honestly, because last month in October, I traveled to Cape Town five times with different brands, stayed in five different insane hotels, um, driving the whole day, eating eight course meals. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's insane to think. I mean, and also, uh, you know, uh, maybe our parents understand it different because they've seen it, but there's a lot of older people that, like, what do you do for a living or what do you do? And they mm. don't understand. They don't understand. Like, you yeah, I make videos or you yeah, I post reviews on the internet and they're like how can you totally. make a living off that and it's it's totally. amazing how you know times have changed where let's say you worked for auto trader or cars and you're a journalist there like there's maybe five journalists there yeah and whereas now you can be your own journalist and completely. make your own living on just by putting it on youtube and, and Instagram. make a hundred percent more money yeah journalists earn peanuts and it's getting to the point now where the younger generation is starting to take over so a lot of the time when I'm on car launches, I'm one of the youngest people there. And, you know, I'll fully admit, I don't know as much as these older seasoned journalists know. They've been around for much longer. They're dinosaurs as far as I'm concerned. So they know tons. So they sort of look at us younger generations as like, you know, we don't know anything. The only thing we have is a smartphone and, in and an internet connection. Which is all you need now. <laughs> Which is all you need. But it also, at the same time, it's it's quite disheartening when you get younger generation journalists that come into the scene and just spew the biggest load of rubbish. And it's like, my audience knows the reputation that I'm upholding is to be credible, honest, and everything. But all of these other journos, they get trapped in the in the like the luxuries of it all, like going to five star hotels. And it gets really political, to be honest with you. It's quite petty where if you insult a car, you don't even need to insult, you just give it some harsh criticism. The PRs of these brands it's like it's their children, which I understand. It is totally their product. But it's like you could say one bad thing about a car and be removed from the list. Then there's no more launch invites. There's no more test cars. And that's, yeah. There's almost no objectivity. You have to be yeah. you know, biased because you got advantage. Yeah. I need to actually maybe not give my honest opinion. Yeah, And I think that's where the money situation comes into play because a lot of people aren't making money from their social platforms. If you're clever and you're business minded, you can make a lot of money. Like a lot of the time I'm selling cars even and I'm making commissions on cars because I'm in the car industry. So I'm connected. It makes sense. Like leverage your connections, of course. So a lot of the guys that are like, okay, I'm going to get a car delivered to me. It's going to have a full tank of petrol. And I want this continuous thing of, I can drive nice cars. I can look cool. I don't have to pay for petrol, like everything's glamour, everything's wonderful. Of course you're going to be biased because you want to carry on driving these cars. Like I've, I've lost a few relationships because I've been honest about cars. And to me, it's like, I, I want to use the platform to help people at the end of the day. I don't want to lie to people because next thing somebody turns around, they buy a car because I said, oh, it's so great. It's wonderful. And it's not that great. Like there's a huge reliability problem, this and that, the technology is whack. It's just not great value for money then it, the, the buck stops at me yeah well i i don't know if this is the case but with ford so i'm no longer with them uh, so i at the time was obviously given fords and whatever not really posting about my own car then i started post then i bought a fortuner and then ford completely stopped you know replying to my message because initially they just dm me on instagram saying you know can we send you the, yeah. this raptor can we send you this wild track whatever and i was like oh, of course and then i posted that I, that I just bought a fortuna and they completely stopped sending me messages they said sorry you know we we're not going to be using you anymore i don't know if that's the case because it i got a toyota could very well be. yeah it could because but then you also have to understand that you also now you've gone you've done a complete 180 degree mm. and you've associated yourself with a different the competition brand. as well exactly so for them it's like okay we can't really work with this guy and that's where it gets really tricky in the automotive industry and it goes back to that whole like the whole pr maintaining relationships thing what i hate about it is that a lot of the industry relies on relationships which to a certain degree makes sense but then you get people going to these top tier car launches that have like 3000 2000 followers and I'm not salty that I wasn't invited. It's just like, 
I reach over 3 million people a month. I've got quite a big voice in the automotive industry. It's like, why not have me there? Which is like, but it's one of the things you have to live with. I mean, I'm still young, 23, making my way in the game. A lot of it has just happened so incredibly fast. And for a lot of the PRs, if you don't reach out to them, then you don't get the access. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing in anything is, you know, not thinking you're too good to not reach exactly. out. Exactly. You know, you, if you want a deal, you can't just wait for you it to happen. You can't just wait for it, no. It's the, the whole thing for me, even when I got into it, it's, it's, it's all about action. Action, action, action. A lot of people just like wait and wait. They're like, oh no, like I'm good enough. So I'm just going to wait until it happens. If you don't get up off your ass and actually do something, get in people's faces, it's just, it's not going to happen. So were you always into cars growing up or was it something that, you know, later on in your life? Yeah, always. Cars have always been a thing. I mean, my mom used to tell me stories because I was quite a problematic child, like severe ADHD, just going crazy off the walls all the time. And she told me stories about how to have me sit still for her to feed me, she'd have to read me car magazines. So I guess I kind of just grew up with an affinity to cars. And my dad also had quite a few cars that he would um, buy and sell quite frequently. My uncle had really high performance cars. So a lot of my childhood, I remember being in really cool cars. So for me, it was always a thing of like, oh, I want this car. Mm. I want this car. I want this car. I want this car. And the sensation of speed and G-force is just so good <laughs> so is your ideal car you know a foster vehicle like a supercar or is it you know what's your you know your favorite vehicle it's oh i was hoping you wouldn't ask me that question because <laughs> it's it's quite a difficult one um I, I don't think i would get a supercar okay okay if i had like three cars yeah yeah let's let's narrow it down so your favorite day-to-day -day car you would choose uh look i'm a bit of a hooligan so i would choose a civic type r it's comfortable it's fast it looks absolutely absurd so when you arrive people know like Oh, that's Sam in his mm. Type R. This like crazy thing with a wing. It's just mad. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely my day to day. I know a lot of other people would choose like a Golf GTI. Yeah, like a Golf I think I take the uh, fo the Focus RS. Yeah, that's a sick car. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. I actually was talking to my dad about it this morning. Where you know now, I mean now Ford's not even bringing in the STs into the country, and it's sad because I mean there's a cult following for those yeah. cars, especially the RS. I mean if you look at the resale value on those RSs, you know you can pick up a for like 550k, and they still got like 60,000 on the clock. Yeah. Yeah, 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 It's amazing how you know they retain their value just because of obviously the scarceness of the vehicle. And it's going to go up. It's going to go up. I keep telling people, if you want to buy a hot hatch, like now is your time because we're getting to the, the, the point now where it's never to be repeated. We will never see another Golf GTI. We might see another Polo GTI. Golf, that GTI nameplate here is dead. They Why? didn't even, because there's no demand for hatchbacks in this country. People have moved on and now people want SUVs. So when we sit at the point where the 162 kilowatt Tiguan four motion, two liter R line, which is essentially like GTI power in an SUV. When that starts outselling Golf GTI, we go, hang on a minute. Something in this industry is reforming. Peugeot don't bring out the 308. Ford discontinued the Fiesta and the Focus. Fiesta was a huge car for South Africa. You can no longer buy one brand new. You can't buy a Focus. Renault discontinued the Megane. The only two hatchbacks that you can buy are the Toyota Corolla and the Mazda 3. That's it. Even hot hatches, Megane RS, doesn't exist. Honda might bring the new Type R. Otherwise, we've only got the two old ones. And now Toyota has just gone on quite a big hot hatch onslaught with their whole GR nameplate with the Yaris GR. Corolla GR will come around a bit later next year. So if you want a hot hatch, like, go and get it. Especially ST and RS. That value will just continuously climb and climb and climb. And those vehicles are still manual, which is also more manual. fun to have. Mm -hmm. They're going to become very highly sought after. I mean... I was con contemplating getting a Fiesta ST because I just had this like stonking Infiniti uh, G37. It charred uh, so much petrol, like 22 liters per hundred. Sure. And I nearly bought a Fiesta ST. And at the time I was looking for STs two years ago, they're around 230, 220 grand for similar mileage and year. Now you're going to pay 275 up to 300,000 rand. And it's, it's like they're going to break through the 300,000 price. They mm. will. Well, I mean, I was looking. So my first vehicle, 2014, was the Polo Vivo GT. That, I think we got it for 180. Now, I mean, a Polo mm. is over 300. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the general Polo, not the Vivo, the normal the Polo, normal it's Polo, over yeah. 400K. I know. And you know what's crazy? So 
when this shape polo came out, the pre-facelift, I was one of the first people in the country to buy the R-Line. I bought it fully kitted, absolutely everything. There was a time people thought it was the new Golf R. They mm. thought it was a polo R. It was like, what, what, what the hell is this thing? I paid 360 out the box for everything. If I want the same car today with all the options, the new polo, it's going to be 560. Yeah. Where did that 200 grand... It's ridiculous. So I, I remember... I was looking, so when I first bought my first vehicle, I got the Golf R, the R-Line, the R-Line. So not the Go, the yeah. R, the R-Line. That I paid, at the time, it had, I think, like 15,000 Ks. It was two two years ago. It was, yeah, maybe like eight months before lockdown. So twenty nine in halfway through 2019. I paid 350 for that. You can't even get a Polo. No, for that can't. now and it's it's can't. ridiculous because i was also looking at the polo gtr then so yeah. that was also it was a 2019 model so not this newer one now so it was the seven i was looking it was about the same price maybe a bit more so maybe closer to 400 yeah it would have been but yeah. now my brother just bought the new polo gtr the 2022 model he paid 550 for it so it's gone up by 200k as yeah. you said in a space of two years it's you know, obviously, you know, being in the industry, is that more due to COVID and supply chain? Um, there is there is quite a few supply issues with semiconductors and everything. Um, but it's, that excuse is just being used a little bit too much. There's also quite a lot of inflation. Yeah. Um, so obviously the price to import cars gets higher. But I think manufacturers are also milking it a bit now. Because it is like, I think a Polo GTI, yeah, starts at around 580,000 rand. So he, if he bought a 22, 2022, he didn't yeah. buy it brand new. It was probably a demo model. But th there's times where, like, a good example was RS3 just came out. The, the car dealerships, like the likes of Fushir, Faro, all of those big ones, they know that these new cars are coming out. So a lot of the time what they do is they try and buy all the stock. They take those new cars, they buy them at the new car price. Like RS3 is like around 1.2, 1.3 million. They buy it at the new price and then go and mark it up like 100, 200K, all the way to 1.4, 1.5. Some, some are up there for 1.6 million rand. And that, that, that's the biggest issue. It is, it is a bit of a stock crisis as well. And dealerships are also so confident. If it's a car that's in demand, like a Polo GTI, if you walk into VW and you try and negotiate a discount, a lot of them will tell you, no. Someone's going to come in after you and buy it anyway. Anyway. So it's getting to the point now, like so many people will say it. With, with a lot of car brands, you can negotiate discounts. Like a good example now, and I think I think your audience should know, if people are looking to buy Ford Rangers, yes, the new one is about to come out, but go and buy a Ford Ranger. Go walk into a Ford dealership, off, give them a stupid, silly offer. Like a Raptor is supposed to be 995,000 Rand. If you walk into a Ford dealership and you offer them 930,000 Rand, you will walk out with a Raptor. So some manufacturers are willing to give away margins, but if it's a popular car that's in demand, Corolla Cross is a good example. They, they, they cannot get enough of those things, and the plant was flooded three months ago. So the order books are like through the roof. It's just pages and pages and pages of names. True. So you're not going to get a, a discount on that. And then a dealership might get hold of one. It's supposed to be 550, or it's actually meant to be less. I think it's like 480, 480 to 550, somewhere around there. Dealership will take that car and sell it for 50, 100 grand more than what you'd get at a Toyota. Because if you're impatient, you're not yeah. willing to wait, you'll just go there and get it. Well, I mean, even if you look at the Suzuki Jimny, when that first came out, that new model, yeah. there was, I mean, there were what, secondhand ones. Obviously, there was a long waiting list yeah. for to get a brand new one, but there were secondhand ones selling at the same price as what you are going to pay once maybe it comes, it gets your turn on the waiting list. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about supply and demand and it's, it's interesting. It's a weird industry at the moment because consumer demand is like for, for some segments of cars, it's there. Then the next month, a new car will be launched and all of a sudden the demand kind of shifts over there. Like a good example is when Nissan released the R35 Skyline GTR. Nobody wanted one. But now you cannot find one. I mean, there's, there's a few for sale, but try and find a good clean one. There's a huge demand for R35 Skylines at the moment. And it's like, where did that come from? You, you guys, you never wanted it in the first place. Even Supras, when Supras first came out, they hit the showroom floor. Everyone was like, oh, mm. I don't know so much. But now, you can't, you can't buy one. Yeah. So it's, it's a weird. Your industry. opinion between like a Z4 and a Supra? Because essentially they, they're about the same. Yeah, I think they're both like, they're both pretty good cars. If you want more of a 
open top, obviously like driving experience, listen to some tunes, then easy driving. You're not going to hammer a car and be on it all the time. You're just more about like, like driving a car spiritedly than get the Z4. But if you like really want to drive, then get the Supra. Because I think it's got a few chassis and suspension tweaks. And obviously being hard top, it has more structural rigidity. Mm. So it's a lot more of a handling car. And also, you know, it's unfortunate if you look at cars like Jeep. Mm. Jeep, I mean, I think they only bring in two vehicles now. They only bring, I think, the Cherokee, or they got, they just brought out that new one. Yeah, we've just so got So let's say three. One. So there's the Renegade. Yeah. There's the Grand Cherokee L, which is... Dude, what a fantastic car. I saw, but this is like 1.5, eh? Uh, for the top of the range, it's 1.6. And then the starting price, you get the limited for 1.2 million, which is also like really well specced. But mm. geez, what a car. It competes with the likes of X7s and GLSs, but it's like half the price. Yeah. And it's, Jeep is still a cool brand to own. Yeah. And if, if when you see it in black with the chrome and the brown interior, you, oh, it's presidential. And it's un, it's unfortunate. I think it's also because of emissions and rules mm. and regulations, everything. But you know, there's almost just three, uh, three like even the Wrangler now. I think people also okay, obviously maybe with this Bucky coming out now, the Gladiator, the Gladiator. But those things are so heavy on fuel. I mean, oh. my, so my dad just bought the three point six liter Sport. Those, or they're all 3.6. Yeah, they're think, all yeah. the Pentastar engine, But, yeah. you know, he says just on the open road, he's only getting 10 and a half liters per 100 Ks, which for me, in my fortune, that's like on a bad day in on town, day, stuck yeah. in traffic. So there's also, a, in South Africa, when you're always trying to, you know, get a good deal of a vehicle, and then also obviously save on and fuel, fuel yeah, and costs stuff, and yeah. everything, and then it becomes a question of, you know, I, I I could get this car. It would be amazing. I can afford the car, but my expenses for the vehicle are going to be so much more at the end of the month. Exactly. And and you know what? This was the thing when Haval first came into the country. Everybody jumped at the Jolion because they were like, you know what? This is a seriously good value for money car, which it is, but it consumes like nearly 15 liters per hundred. Sure. So everybody bought these cars and there was a period of time, I think it was like two or three months, like after they were getting released or even two or three months after that, we just had an influx of Jolions at the dealerships because people were selling them because they just consumed too much petrol. So even if it's value for money, yeah, fuel consumption is a is a huge factor. Then people were willing to forgo all of the technology and all of the luxuries that you get with buying a Haval. That is something that's very interesting with you know with those the new vehicles now coming out, even like the cherries and all of those, is the technology and the luxury you get inside the vehicle is amazing. Yes, maybe it doesn't have the badges that we might want with vehicles, you know, of SUV size. Yes, like your Toyota badges, your Nissan badges. The price is like two hundred K less. Maybe also the reliability of the engine is maybe sketchy because they haven't been around as long. But no. they are giving out five-year motor plans. With Cherry, it's like an unlimited mileage. But if, when everybody asks me about Chinese cars, it's quite a it's a difficult subject to navigate because they haven't been around for that long. So when they come into the market, obviously they're going to be priced aggressively. It's like when Kia and Hyundai first arrived here. They were so cheap. And over time, as the quality got better, the demand became more. And also remember when Kia and Hyundai got here? It was a while ago. Our parents will remember. But... People were like, oh, that's a South Korean car. Like, I'm not going to buy a mm. South Korean car. Like, what the hell? It's the same thing with the Chinese cars. South Africans are so brand conscious. Like, think about the people who drive Hiluxes. If you pull up to, to a guy who drives a Hilux in anything that isn't a Hilux, he's like, what the hell? Yeah. You know, it's Toyota for life. It's just how <laughs> it is. Yeah. And we are the people who criticize, like, if it's made in China, it's going to break. If made in China, it's cuck. All of this, all of this. But as soon as there's a price point and there's value for money, that just gets thrown out the window mm. completely. So it's essentially it's it's gone all the days where it's like okay, this is the brand of the car. It's more okay. This is what it costs me to buy the car, so people aren't going to judge me yeah. because they know it was eight hundred k or they know it was a certain price. Totally. But I and mean that new GT that Avals brought out. I don't. I saw you did a video yeah. on it and it looks cool. I've seen a few drive past me and you know how is it as a vehicle actually? It's. So we did the launch in Cape Town and Haval positioned the car as like a sporty SUV. It's got like a, a variable exhaust, which is cool. It makes a little bit of noise. It sounds like a GTI, which you would not expect out of an mm -hmm. SUV. Um, Power is not bad. It's 150 so kilowatts. So I don't know. It drives really well as a day-to-day -day SUV, 
But if you're going to drive it like a sporty SUV, that's so it's like eight point seven seconds or to hundred. Yeah, so it's not that fast. Yeah. Even even the handling, like the suspension, it's not as it's not as well damped as something like a Kia or a Nissan. So people must understand that yes, Havals and all of that are cheaper, and they are good cars. But once you start analyzing and nitpicking, and if you drive like a Kia and a Haval or a Nissan or a Hyundai back to back, you will feel those slight differences. But for the normal average Joe, that's just going to potter around about town, they want something that looks cool. Oh, I can make it go verpa. Then it's a it's a pretty decent car for someone who's like don't really care that much about driving. Mm. And it comes with the, the, the feature list is is insane. I mean, the car can drive itself, lane keep, lane tracking blind spot monitoring, collision assist. The list goes on and on and on. And South Africans are also so hungry for value for money. Mm. Like they want those features without having to pay an arm and a leg. Well, I mean, if you look at their buckies, like the P-Series, my mate actually recently got one who had his bachelor's and he was a bit too drunk, so I had to drive his car for him. <laughs> and it was actually an amazing car. I mean, even just the angle of the cameras when you're turning no. and how you, if you turn left, a camera pops up when you're turning left, obviously more in like a parking yeah, environment. Yeah. And you can see so much more. And I mean, I've obviously got a Toyota Fortuner, which doesn't have any of that, but nope. it cost me 200K more. Exactly. And the, the, the scary part is that is the Bucky with the most amount of features in the market currently. I mean, until maybe the new Raptor comes out and it, a little bit more but then it's going to be like 500k mm. more than a p-series i mean you can get one with a sunroof yeah what kind of a bucky comes with a sunroof and the size of the screen is huge digital displays again adaptive cruise control lane keep assist and those seats and the seats are really comfortable but it's it's what lies underneath the car so for a lot of people they can prioritize technology features and and all of that that's why i have such a gripe like when people go out and buy a rental quid i'm just like don't don't do that because you're getting caught in this whole like it's got Apple CarPlay, it's got this, it's got that. You're gonna die in that car. Go buy. Isn't it rated the most unsafe vehicle? Yeah, it's not safe at all. And I'll probably get into trouble for saying this, but there's there's a whole lot of cars like that where I would go. I I cannot viably recommend this car to you. Go and buy a used Honda Jazz or a used Suzuki Swift with a bit of mileage. You're gonna be safe. It's gonna be reliable. You're just gonna have to pay for services. Well, my mom. So she. We were speaking about Jimny's earlier. She had the Jimny for a bit. And then my dad was actually like, no, I, this is actually, it just seems a bit unsafe for mm. you. There was a period where my car, my battery was dead and I had to get a new one. So I, I drove hers for a few days. And it was cool and it's a fun little nice runaround car, but you actually don't really want to go on the highway too often with the Jimny. No, I like the Jimny's. Uh, it's awesome car. But Ama it's a purposeful amazing car. car. And it's, I think it's the perfect vehicle if you live at the coast, if you may be driving, you know, max 50Ks, you know, so her, so her mom lives in Leidenburg and it's not too safe, especially like overtaking the power issues that it yeah. might have, being a four-speed gearbox, you know, I mean, you like redlining if you're going 120. So it's an amazing, I mean, but I mean the capabilities, the 4x4 yeah, four capabilities, I think it was this one, you know, video I was watching where they had a G-Wagon, a Wrangler and the Jimny. And it was Car Wow, I think, was mm, the YouTube mm. channel. And, you know, the, the ratings, the G-Wagon rated 20, and the Jimny and the Wrangler were both 19 based on all the things. Which so it's, a, it's an amazing vehicle and a great vehicle. And, and it is fun to drive. It just felt a little bit too boxy. Yeah, I get you. It's a perfect car for Cape Town. Yeah, exactly. Cape Town, like if you live in Mschlango or yeah, like those totally places, yeah. I think that's a, the perfect place for it. But if you, you know, traveling from Joburg to Pretoria to, <sighs> I mean, you don't want to drive more than three hours in that vehicle. I would say so, yeah. And you know what's crazy? Some people road trip them, eh? Yeah. But I, I, there was a video, I think Cars released it, where they went to Botswana in them. And I mean, yes, it's an amazing vehicle to do 4 by 4 and all of that, but I think it's just... If you do get an accident with those, I don't know like what rating it has in terms I'm of safety and everything. I'm also not too sure. But I mean, it's amazing. And it's also got a cult following. It's also one of those it vehicles where, because I mean, yeah. my mom's, every time she drives past someone in a gym, they were waving at each other, <laughs> greeting each other. I mean, that's what they do like yeah. in the old Land Rovers. Yes, exactly. they're doing in the gymnies. The Wrangler owners also do it. Yeah. There's a couple of car car fraternities that do it. And I tried like, it with my Fortuna, but yeah. there's just no, so no, many. No, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> but that's like what you were saying when you opened up the podcast. South Africa has such a rich car culture and people just, they just want to have experiences. They just want to see what's out there. And we're so fortunate in terms of the media space where 
we can look at first world countries like the USA, Europe, UK, and we can analyze the trends there and see what's happening. Everything that we're doing right now in South Africa is, I'd like to say we're, we're in our own way pioneering a space because we're doing things that have been done, but we're doing them in our own way because we've analyzed and we've said, ah, oh, okay, cool. This is how we can do it better. But everything we've done has happened in the States. All the people several that years ago. Several years ago yeah. already. So this is just the natural flow of progression where we can go, okay, cool, now it's it's our turn to do something really big and something so epic. And there's such cool communities in South Africa that we can we can leverage. Like you do a lot of fitness. And I know a lot of fitness people. It's quite a small circle. And it's really wealthy people as well. Like people in the fitness industry have pretty decent money. So to be able to monetize that is it's flipping incredible. Mm. I think, you know, and actually I wanted to ask you this, but it's a, I think cars themselves, sell, they sell themselves. Like if you're interested in cars, you know, I might just follow you. But mm. do you, you know, in terms of marketing, like do s certain videos with certain things, you know, to try to get more views, like let's say, you know, a, a title where it's like, don't buy this vehicle if you mm. want to want to be safe. Silly example. But, you know, those sort of things. Or have you seen through social media, this is more obviously just the more analytical side, yeah. that you've seen, okay, well, I'm doing a a video on this Merc. It's going to do well anyway. I don't really need to add some sort of, you know, clickbaity type thing. Yeah, no, I hear I hear what you're saying. Um, it's very It's very dependent on what car it is in a sense, because something like a Mercedes, people are gonna buy it anyway because of the badge. Mm. You know, it's it's not enough for me to say, okay, don't buy this, buy a Tiguan. But the, the two are also different competitors. The GLB is a great car, like go buy the GLB, it is a good car. But pe people are gonna buy it anyway. But with cars, it's so difficult, man. With cars like a Renault Quid, for example, we're just going to use that as an example now because we've already done it. So I can only get into so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you can do your best to educate the consumer and list reasons like don't buy it for A, B, C, and D. But you also need to think as the consumer would. You know, somebody buying a Renault Quid might be somebody who's previously been taking taxis and it costs them nearly 2,000 Rand a month. You can get into a brand new Renault Quid for 2,000 Rand a month. And then all you need to worry about is petrol. And you've got some of those technologies that and are And you've a got some of those technologies. Bonus. And guess what? Your life is at danger when you're in a taxi anyway. So you might as well take control of your life and put it into your own hands. I don't care that I'm driving a car with a zero star safety rating. I'm in what control. What is it about it that has zero? Like, does it not have airbag? Does it have airbag? It's, or? It, it, they, it's got one airbag, but when it first released, it didn't have ABS. So, and that that's quite dodgy. Like if you have to make an emergency braking in the rain, the car's just going to skid and go straight, yeah. like into the car in front of you. You won't be able to turn. Our bicycle's anything. probably got better brakes. Well, exactly. <laughs> that and that's the thing. Your bicycle's got bigger tires as well. Yeah. So, when it comes to the more premium cars, the best you can do is try and compare. That's that's where I've noticed a bit of a gap in terms of like creators where people are lacking. Maybe I shouldn't have just exposed that. <laughs> um, but the best you can do is take one car like two topically talked about cars, Haval Jolion, Corolla Cross. And you can put those two together because that's the cars that people cross shop. And then you can reach the consumer and say like, listen, these are the differences between the two. Now you can go and think about it. But if you're doing cars by themselves, like yes, you're being informative and you're telling people about the car, but it's not really helping me to make my decision because it's still like, but what about the other ones? Like what about the X3? What about the X1? What about the um, Q3 and the Q2? Should I go and buy those cars? But I haven't filmed any content on them. So it does, yeah, it gets a bit difficult. What car segments do you mainly do? Like price, is there like a price range that you mainly focus on? Is it, you know, all spectrums of cars or yeah, all whatever all deals come through? It'll For me, it'll be all spectrums. Um, so later on in November, I'm getting the Suzuki Celerio, which is going to be the cheapest car I've ever tested like it is a pure budget car and I like doing cars like that as well because it speaks to a wider range mm. of audience especially in South Africa especially in South Africa like yeah it's really cool to film supercars and like six by six G wagons like that's crazy stuff that gets a lot of views because people do want to see that mm. but if I get an opportunity to provide value that is more topically relevant to more people then I'll latch onto that so yeah there's there's budget cars. That six by six G wagon. Do you want to? I, I always <laughs> obviously watch the video. Some people that haven't, 
you know, do you know that South Africa, what is his name? Like, do you know what business he was in that he was able to? How many, he made right. 12, he got 12 made, or what is it? They, they, they made, so Brabus made 15, and the for one- For South Africa. No, 10 for South Africa. Because this guy wanted one, and he went to Brabus, and he was like, yo, I want a six by six. And Brabus told him, you can only have one if we sell 15, and they only had five orders in. So he bought all 10 to fulfill the, the full shipment. And then he sold them to all of his friends before Brabus even began building them. What's the selling price now on one? Uh, like 18 million rand. But they would have had to buy it with the full Brabus conversion. So probably around 24, 25 million rand, which is insane. But apparently it's in that whole um, Johan Rupert Mafia book. Because it was, it, was, it was those guys. It was the Ruperts and their friends that bought all these cars. Crazy. And it's, it's actually amazing how, you know, the story, just G-Wagon itself... Mm. how it was mainly made for like shakes and deserts and yeah. all of that and how how it's such an amazing awesome vehicle and now it's seen like as a status thing completely and even before that it was a military vehicle so that's that's where g-wagon actually originated like when you open the door of a g-wagon there's a little plaque and it says stronger than time and there's a date on it i think it's like i, I don't know what it is it might be 1940 or 1960 something but that is when the g-wagon was originally when it was originally thought out, it was to be a military vehicle, even the six by six. So did it have like the same engine that it's got now? Because obviously now it's way more sporty. Or yeah. was it, you know, more combat style? Yeah, it, was it like would a have been. Stronger towing type engine or... Possibly. Because I would assume it wouldn't... What, what engine does it have now? Now, the they, they come in two different trims. So you get the 400D, which is a three liter diesel, which is the one I would personally take. Then you get the G63. Yeah which is a 4.4 liter uh, twin turbo V8. Like I would work. assume the G63 wasn't really used for the military no, no, purposes. No, no, no. Not even the 400D. Yeah. The engines back then for the military would have been like really basic V6s or V8s, stuff that you can easily work on during like in the field of battle. Like when people are shooting bullets at you, now your car's broken and you need a spanner, you need to fix something. Yeah. It would be easy cars to work on. I think for me personally, like, out of all the vehicles there are, and especially it's Africa, you know, dodging potholes, this and that. Obviously, it's mainly, so they've also got low profile tires yeah. in their car. But, you know, that's the vehicle for me that's perfectly ideal. A G Wagon. A G Wagon. No Just way. because of the speed. Really? And because, I mean, the 4x4 capabilities are still amazing. Obviously, maybe get different tires, not low profile tires because yeah. you hit a pothole. The, the ground yeah. clearance isn't amazing either, but I think that's the perfect vehicle. For me in, in South Africa, yeah. I think it's the stupidest car really? ever. I think it's such a dumb car. It's got I, the aerodynamics of a brick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like this brick going I just think it looks cool. It looks cool. It obviously cool. drives really nicely. It's very luxurious. The new ones, yeah. The, the previous one drove terribly. Really? The steering was so vague. Like, you could be flat-footing it, turn a little bit left, and the car will still be going straight. So there's absolutely no sense of direction yeah. in the car. It's actually quite sketchy. I think now... I actually want to discuss that with you as well in terms of if you think it's a good vehicle, the new Discovery. The Discovery sorry, the Defender. Not, the Defender, sorry. The Defender. The Defender. Because for a th probably a half the price of a G-Wagon, you can get a Defender. Yeah. You know, I would get the short wheelbase Defender nice because that's yeah. an awesome vehicle. Still obviously a big price tag of like yeah. 1.5, 1.6 yeah, yeah. or whatever. But an amazingly awesome vehicle I would definitely maybe change the tires because I was watching a, I was watching a video. They had the Wrangler, they had the Ford Bronco, and then they had the um, Defender. Sorry, am I saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, for my brain. All these car names. <laughs> so they had those three vehicles. Ten minutes into the ride, this um, the Defender's tire got slashed on some rock or whatever. Wow. They replaced it. They drove it again. Happened again, so they had to stop doing the review, and then they just carried on with the Wrangler and the Bronco. Yeah. So, okay. for that price, you know, maybe seven hundred k more than. Obviously, we don't get the Bronco here, but yeah, more than the Wrangler, that we must also talk about that. And it is the Defender is a more luxurious car yeah. than the Wrangler, and this was the whole thing when Land Rover announced that they were going to discontinue, discontinue the Defender and make it a more modern vehicle. The enthusiast, the outcry, yeah. oh my word, people were like, people were really upset. You should but I mean, that's that. probably, I would say in South Africa, probably the biggest cult following is like the Defender Definitely, group. Completely. But think about how much more of a wider audience Land Rover opened themselves, like opened themselves up to. Yeah. Those Defenders are everywhere. They're everywhere in Santon, everywhere in Bryanston Foys. You just, literally, that most likely in a big sense 
gave Land Rover most of their sales this year. And the Defender now is to the point of luxury where the Defender could have been called a discovery and people would have believed it. And the, the, the discovery that we have it's now could have been discontinued. Yeah, uh, I don't think, I don't, it's not nice at all. The discovery, the back of the, the discovery. The back, yeah, everybody oh, doesn't terrible. like the back, the proportions. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit weird, it is quite That's annoying. why, I mean, the Defend, obviously, it discovery is a bit cheaper, but, you know, the Defender, the, and it's also a beautiful car. It is a good looking car. It's a very good looking it car. Is. I would buy one. Yeah, definitely. I would actually probably take that over a G-Wagon. Because, but also, I don't need the performance that a G-Wagon would give. Compa mm. Obviously, what what is the the fastest Defender? You actually get a five liter supercharged yes. V8. Yeah. You do. That came out pretty recently, and that I've seen that. That and I listened to that. That was incredible. One of the best sounding V8s ever made. That. And the coolest thing is, within that engine family, is also, in my opinion, one of the best sounding V6s in the Jaguar F-Type. Mm. The V6. What's the the Land? The SVT. Oh, SVR. SVR, SVR. Cool. Yeah, those are crazy. We drove those around Kyle Army Racetrack once, like a couple of years ago. Fun. Jeez. And it was the first time I'd ever driven in SVRs. And I was like, your performance Jaguars are mad. And yeah. I got to drive the, you know, the Springbok Range Rover? Yes, yeah. That SVR. I got to drive that exact car around the nice. racetrack. I, I see JC Creel always has that one. Yeah. Does he have it now? I, I don't know about now, but I always see like sometimes on his Instagram yeah. and stuff, you know, they give him that vehicle. And I know, I think Toyota's partnered with him. Okay. They did a whole Springbok. Yes. Toyota I actually highlights. do think I saw JC post something about a Toyota. Yeah, you might have. Yeah. And I think that's also, you know, being in the space, it is also difficult because you can't, like as a rugby player, and I, actually I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to say this anyway because I don't think I would get him in trouble because I think it might have been before he did really well. But Jesse Creel, when he used to train in Pretoria, he had the RS3. Yeah. But you can't ever post about that because you're with the Springboks and they with Land Rover, they with Toyota. So you can't exactly. show your personal vehicles. It, it gets, I think it gets really interesting when these influencers get technology sponsorships and they get given phones. Mm. Like there's a lot of guys in our space who also do technology. They probably got like a Huawei or something. Yeah, they'll yeah. like Huawei will give them a phone yeah. or Vivo or Mobicell. But you'll see them, like they'll post about it the day before and then the very next day. They're using their iPhone. <laughs> yeah, you'll see them on launch at a car event and they're using their iPhone and it's like, yeah, you know? But I think that's the space in general for anything that's yeah. given to you as a sponsorship or whatever is you have to use those supplements. Like, I'll be honest, Nutricon sponsor this podcast, right? They make certain supplements, but they don't make, they're going to launch an insurance product, but they don't make certain things that maybe 32GI makes. Yeah. So I'm going to use 32GI, or I'm going to use Biogen's gel, or I'm going to use these things. And if it's in a video, it's in a video, but that's also depending on contract. But mm. I've, you know, if they don't do something, like, let's talk about those people with the creators, with their phones. If you use your phone on a gimbal, you want to use an iPhone. Yeah. You don't want to use any other brand. So you're creating the content that allows you to get the sponsorship Completely. through an iPhone, but now you've been sponsored by someone else. You can't now use that product actually for yeah. what you're doing that got you the sponsorship because your quality is going to go yeah. down. Yeah, and a lot of the time you'll get sponsored a lower tier phone. Yeah. But it's all because they just want people to know about their brand. Mm. I think, how do you... Have you got, you know, deals or offers or something, even just, you know, come to this launch or whatever where you're like, that doesn't fit my brand or... Um, I can't really think of a time. Maybe not a launch or like... But like an event. Yeah, so, or yeah. something where it's just like, that's taking a step back or... Which is like a bit weird yeah. to attend such a thing. Um, I think, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, gala dinners are the biggest waste of time. It is just... So even like the car awards, yeah. No, the car awards that was cool, yeah. That was cool because that was like a whole like content creator yeah. awards thing, and that was very valuable because I got to network. But when a lot of companies will try and host these car influencer meetups where they invite all the influencers to like a, a location and they'll say, Okay, cool, we're gonna have like this cool car, yeah, this cool car, yeah, this cool car, yeah. and they just try and invite you so they can get free yeah. press. And it's like you just stand there with people and Shame. I really the, the the car community is a really good community, but there aren't that many people that are turned on. Mm. Like they don't see past just oh I'm gonna make a car video. Like they don't think about how much more of a business it could be and how much money you could actually make if you're smart enough to actually do it and leverage. 
So with them, like we go stand around and we network and stuff, but it's like, we only just talk about cars. I'm like, okay, guys, we can, we can talk about other things. You know, we can talk about business. We can talk about partnering up together to maybe release a product and monetize it and do something, something epic. So when it's stuff like that, I, yeah, I don't really, I don't really like, yeah. like to go to them. I saw you, did, you had, there was a girl in one of your videos where like, it was the mic was in a plant. Yeah, or Reba. So was that uh, like a collab you did or? Yeah, so a lot of the time, I haven't done it in a while. I should actually do it more often because um, people enjoyed it. I'll do a collab with another creative and I'll get them to speak in a different language just so that we can reach a different audience. So was she a car creator as well? Yeah, or? yeah. Reba is a car journalist. She's okay. on a lot of the launches that I'm with. And then myself and Kumbi, he's like features on Talk Radio 702 and all of that. So he does also quite a bit of um, influencing we did the Ford Raptor together and then we used a stick as a microphone. But that was something I was doing. I need to keep doing it. Yeah, I just had a little bit of flair while. to it. Yeah, I filmed this one Kia video and I ripped a baby's head off. Like, I was not a real baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like a baby doll. And I stuck it in the cup holder to illustrate that the car had two cup holders in the rear. And I thought it was like a little bit risky. I mean, to show that the boot could open by itself, I took it in its pram and I threw it into the boot. And I was like, oh, you can fit all your crap in it. And everybody loved it. Yeah. Just being silly and... Just for the gags, I think South Africans are also just looking for a little bit of comedic relief. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Have you, obviously, you know, you've done exceptionally well, but has there ever been a brand where they gave you a car, let's say, and you didn't do enough for them, or even though you did do enough, yeah. they claim that you never, or... Oh, I don't want to throw people under no, you don't have bus. to say the brand name, um, you can just say if it's happened, or... But yeah, it, it happened recently. I got a car from a manufacturer, and it's during a time when they, it's within their best interest to sell more of these cars because the new one is coming out and they gave me the car for quite a long time and i did as much content as i could possibly do with the car showing everyone the car hyping it up and everything so you want that, that kind of content to be organic you don't you want, want it to be forced yeah i also don't want it to be forced but at the same time that was like a couple of months ago and my page had twenty thousand followers today i'm sitting at like 60 something thousand followers so when that happened uh, all of a sudden i just got busier than i've ever been before i mean the month of October was supposed to be when most of the stuff was supposed to happen. So I was a little bit delayed in putting out content and everything. Um, Cause I mean, I was in Cape Town for five months. It was so difficult to stay on top of my business and still do the car thing. So I'm like trying to negotiate with this guy and say like, listen, dude, like I'm really struggling at the moment. I am going to do the content. I'm just going to be a little bit delayed, but mm. it, it is going to happen. Like that's one thing I will stick to it and over deliver if I can. Um, but while I had the car and while I was giving it free press, they were having other launches and other events that were going to be for the new model car. And I wasn't invited. And I was like, but like it it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because I'm going crazy about the old one. People are messaging me. It's getting hundreds of thousands of views on the platform. But now one plus one equals two. Let's take this guy who's been giving this all this car so much press. And let's take him to go and show everybody the new one straight afterwards. Like strike while the pan's hot. Mm. Isn't that what they say? And it just it never happened. But I also think it's down to faulty, faulty management. And also the industry. It's like it's a lot of the, the managing directors and PRs for these companies aren't yet realizing how powerful social media is. Yeah. There's still that perception that, oh, you know, you're making TikTok videos. So there's children that are watching your videos. But go and have a look at the comments on those videos. A lot of the time, it's actual owners of cars. And you can just go look at the analytics and be like, well, this is the age of Exactly. The like I said, majority of my audience is um, 25 to 40 years old. 25-year-olds, okay, not necessarily buying cars. But the rest of that portion of people, they are engaged shoppers mm. in the market that are looking at cars like this GLB that's got quite a bit of technology because they are still part of that generation that can be quite tech savvy. So f for a lot of the time, it's like... It, yeah, it pisses me off. Like there was an incident with another manufacturer where we did this whole like off-road launch and I, it was an off-road car. Like it, it was built to be hammered off-road and I did a little bit of a skid in the grass to get an exhaust note. And all of a sudden, I'm taken completely off of that group's list. Was that because you were being negligent or they thought you were being negligent? Or yeah, what perhaps. Look, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a fool sometimes. I do play the fool. But like, that's what gives the video some character, yeah. you know, I'm not just like in line all the time. If like there's an open piece of land over there and I'm in an off-road car, I'm like, heck, it would be really cool to get this thing doing a little bit of a donut. And guess what? The video got 1.5 million views. 
the coverage that I did on that car beat every single other publication combined on that day. It's like, how much does it matter that I did that now? Come on. What can happen? What can happen? If it's an open no. field, like what it's can happen? It's a literal open field. I'll show you the video afterwards. Yeah, check it's it out. It's literally like five seconds. So uh, it's also like, yeah, brands are brands are really, really sensitive. And you know, like, it's we're not at the time where we want to be burning bridges. But a lot of the time, like, it can happen out of, like, it can be really petty. And the thing is, for a lot of the manufacturers and a lot of the cars, where the relationship, wouldn't say it's gone bad, but it would be a little bit of effort to try and get a car from them. Like, I'd have to really, really motivate to try and get a car. And... From my point of view, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to put so much effort following up on emails, sending this whole big proposal. This is how many videos I'm going to shoot. I'm not going to get paid. Mm. So I'm not going to go through the effort to do it. I'm rather going to focus on tasks that can make me money. Yeah. And it's that's like, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, that's an amazing way to close is basically just work smarter, not harder. Yeah, it's a total like work smart, not hard. But the whole industry is, it's reforming. Like, people need to watch out. I mean, the days of reading articles, I mean, it's still there. People do yeah. pick up and buy but magazines. Uh, people, cars releases an article and they release a YouTube video. I don't know the analytics, but I'm pretty sure more people are watching the video. 100%. 110% people and are watching And that's the, the way video. it's going is, and especially with people's concentration, now, ugh, you know, they're doing a 10-minute review, I'm going to watch your 60-second review. Yeah. And honestly, the only reason why my platform really took off is because I was one of the first people to actually go, wait a second, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put myself behind the camera and I'm going to film a review. There's actually two guys, myself and Matthew and I, we both kind of like woke up at the same time and we both reaped the rewards of that. Yeah. Which is, it's insane. Like, And now the other creators are only starting to come on board and actually go, Blurp, I need to make videos. Like now Auto Trader and Cars.coza are making videos. And it's like, ah. You guys caught on too late. Welcome to the party, everyone. So it's uh Awesome. Well, bro, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for taking out the time to come here and I look forward to seeing all the vehicles that you <laughs> and all the videos that you make. Shots, thanks, Jesse. Awesome. It's a privilege to be on, bro. Great. And anyway, thank you guys for listening. <laughs>